and please start. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Independent Sage. COVID is continuing to circulate and infect us. And it's not just causing symptoms for a few days, but we've got the impact of long COVID. And this week, the WHO Director General, Dr. Tedros, said that the numbers are clear that long COVID is devastating people's lives and livelihoods, affecting tens of millions of people and wreaking havoc on health systems and economies. And he talked about immediate access to antivirals for patients at risk, more on research, supporting patients, physical and mental health and financial support. Now in the UK, we have a record number of 7 million people waiting for treatment with NHS, partly linked to the way NHS has been neglected by government, but also the added burden of COVID. And in the economy, um, Camilla Cavendish in the Financial Times reported that our low unemployment figures hide an uncomfortable truth. That is that growing numbers of people are not seeking work at all. And she points out that long COVID affects 1.5 million people, 10 to 20% of those infected. So that's a major contributor to absenteeism as well. So we have to be vigilant about COVID. Uh, and today we're having a full on public question and answer session because we've received so many great questions on the current wave, long COVID variants, vaccines, et cetera. But before we address them, we're going to have the latest COVID numbers and trends presented for us this week by Dr. Duncan Robertson. Over to you, Duncan. Thanks very much, Anthony. Right, so uh, we are um, uh, looking at uh, infections rising in England. And of course, we, we're looking back uh, a few days to the end of uh, the period ending 3rd of October. Um, seems to be levelling off in other uh, UK countries. Um, good news is that hospitalizations appear to be stabilizing. Um, we still have a kind of mixture of Omicron variants that are out there, um, some with very significant growth potential, but we're still not clear which one is going to dominate. But there is very much potential for further hospitalizations. Um, so even though the rates might be uh, leveling off at the moment, there's still scope for them to increase in the weeks ahead. Uh, other relatively good news is that uh, in hospital transmission, the proportion of uh, people getting uh, or expected to, to have COVID from in hospital it seems to be decreasing, which is good. But this is all against the backdrop of very intense hospital and ambulance pressure. So in terms of infections, the ONS survey back to the 3rd of October, um, we can see the red line there being England. Uh, cases are increasing. But this is, you know, it does seem as though the rate of increase is slowing down, which is good. Um, and in uh, in uh, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland, it does seem to be levelling off. Um, so, but it's a mixed picture according to who you are in terms of your age. So we can see in school children, year seven to 11, that's definitely decreasing. Uh, older people definitely increasing, but this is compared, this is up to the 3rd of October. So quite what's happening now uh, is more difficult to work out. But if we compare, we combine this with the hospitalisation rates, which seem to be levelling off, I think we can, uh, you know, there's certain evidence to say that actual infections now might be plateauing. And you can see, you know, the effect on, on school children. So we said that uh, year seven to 11 is definitely decreasing and year age two to school year six, so primary school children, uh, that does seem to be levelling off at the moment. So in terms of hospital data, uh, this is good news, I think. Uh, hospital admissions seem to be levelling off at the moment, which is excellent because, of course, this is um, the pressure that we have. But I think the risk is, of course, if we get new variants that come along, that line will only have decreased a certain amount before potentially we get another variant wave. So uh, we're not out of the woods by any means. Um, this is splitting it between under 65s and over 65s, and we can see relatively similar dropping off um, uh, in the, both age groups, which is good. Um, and it does vary uh, across the country. Um, we're seeing basically increase, uh, increases in some regions, decreases in other regions. So on average, uh, hospital admissions are levelling off. Um, the other thing, as well as looking at how many people are going into hospital, how many people are admitted into hospital, you can look at the occupied beds. This is still creeping up, 
but hopefully this will stabilize in the weeks ahead. And splitting it between primarily treated for COVID and primarily treated with COVID, um, we can still see there are slight increases in occupied beds, but hopefully this will level off, but we can never tell what's gonna happen until we have the data. Um, and this is the trend across different regions in terms of occupied beds. Um, some of these, these regions are different sizes, so you can't necessarily compare them directly. So you can look at the trends. Um, and so good news in say the Northwest where they're leveling off. Uh, in terms of the performance indicators for hospital and ambulance trusts, um, this is what we've been saying for a long time, the pressure on ambulance services, uh, category three and category four are certainly very high delays from uh, in terms of response times. But I think what's perhaps more significant is this increase, this prolonged increase that we're seeing in uh, category one and category one T, um, which are very much above the uh, target and, main, uh, and maintained above the target. So this is putting huge pressure on ambulance um, trusts. And looking at how long it takes for people to arrive at hospital and to uh, be treated or discharged, it's creeping up. Uh, so 29% are uh, having to stay more than four hours uh, to be treated, uh, or sorry, admitted, tra uh, transferred or discharged. This is quite a um, kind of shocking uh, slide here. The number of uh, A&E attendants is more than 12 hours from the decision to admit. Uh, that's gone up to 6.7%. And you can see, you know, going back, you know, 10 years, uh, this is kind of unprecedented and um, is increasing as well. So this is very much a concern. And of course, you know, you have to think we're at the beginning of October or middle of October, the pressures of winter haven't hit yet. So what's going to happen over winter is possibly um, not good. Uh, and of course, the number of people having COVID in the community, it's not confined to the community, it, it's, uh, it also affects uh, NHS staff, so we can see sickness tracking up again, so this kind of compounds the pressure, so you've got pressure in terms of admissions, but then you've got pressure in terms of uh, number of people in who can staff these hospitals. I think we saw that with the blood donation um, call that we had. Um, basically, one of the reasons for that is the staff to actually take blood um, isn't necessarily there. So it's great to see the response from the public, but there's still pressures on the NHS. Um, and in terms of number of people waiting for treatment in England, uh, 7 million of us, one in eight people in England are waiting to start treatment. So, um, yeah very much going the wrong way. And uh, looking at consultant treatment within 18 weeks of referral, uh, that's falling. So the target's 92% uh, to be referred, to be um, uh, to be started that treatment within 18 weeks. Target's 92% and we're now down to 61% and falling. So you can see all these are kind of producing a story about the intense pressure in the NHS, as I say, before we've hit the uh, peak winter period. Um, and looking at people uh, waiting for more than one year to, to start uh, treatment, non-emergency treatment, 5.5%. Um, it went over this huge peak at the beginning of, of COVID, but we still haven't got in any way back to the levels we had pre-COVID. So whether this is the new normal is, is very much up to debate. Um, looking at patients waiting more than six weeks or more than 13 weeks, um, for tests, once again, creeping up. So, you know, even though, um, uh, you know, we're not in this, this, this first phase of COVID, these pressures are compounding and all the metrics are looking bad and getting worse. So, uh, for example, the number of patients waiting longer than two months to start treatment for following a G urgent GP referral, that is increasing. So this is for first treatment for cancer. So you can see the targets are there, 15%. We're now up to um, uh, over 35%. So significant deviations from those targets. Vaccinations. So, uh, you know, relatively good news in terms of the booster campaign. So this is for over 65s, but you can see there's huge disparities between the constituent countries of the UK, England at 53%, Northern Ireland at less than half of that. 
at 26 percent so um but you know that's not 100 percent in any of those countries so there's still scope for people to get their boosters so it'll be very important to have their boosters uh over this winter period so um and you know, this is kind of dual campaign of covid boosters plus flu uh vaccinations as well so get both um, and we can see over 70, uh, sorry, 65s to 74 year olds and over 75s creeping up at a really relatively steady rate. So we're still in this phase where more people are getting their vaccinations or their boosters, which is good to see, but, uh, you know, still a way to go. And other good news is uh, the uh, booster um, is available for over 50s. I think that started today or yesterday. So if you're over 50, you can go and get your COVID booster now. Um, as well as other people who are pregnant, frontline health and social care workers or more clinically vulnerable. So, uh, you know, go out and get your vaccines. And just finally, just thinking about what may be coming. It's very difficult to know what is coming um, because some of the sequencing is, isn't done as much as it was. But these charts are from Tom Wensleyers and we can see there are very clear classified um, waves of uh, um, of beta, alpha, beta, delta, and then Omicron. And then we're looking at to see what's coming next. And this is um, this is up. This is data up until, uh, you know, relatively today ish. Um, uh, I think this is this is global data. And we can see that we're not seeing individual variants. These are all um, groups of Omicron um, variants. And um, they've been grouped in this way of level four, level five and level six variants. So these are all different from each other, but it's a way of seeing what may be coming. And this is data from the UK. Uh, the dots are actual data and the lines are projections of that data. So, you know, what, what is coming? We don't know what indiv individual variant, but it may be BQ1.1 uh, or XBB. I think BQ1.1 uh, tends to be more in Europe. XBB tends to be in South or Southeast um, Asia. So what's to come? We don't know, but we're still looking at that data. So there we are, infections rising in England, but that's going back to the 3rd of October. Hospitalizations, thankfully, appear to be stabilizing. We have this variant soup from Omicron. Uh, we don't quite know what's coming, but there are certainly lots of potential variants coming. Um, uh, in hospital transmission has, has decreased, uh, but once again, as we say, have said for a long time, there's this intense ambulance and hospital pressure, which is putting very much uh, very severe pressure on the NHS even before winter. Thank you. Duncan, thanks very much. They're fascinating figures. I'm, I'm pretty horrified by the NHS figures. And uh, when governments say that they're not going to cut public spending, um, that's fine, except we're in a 9.9% inflationary environment. So just keeping the same level of spending means in the next year, we're going to ha effectively have nearly a 10% cut in health education. So it's all extremely worrying, but we've got a lot of questions to get through, fascinating ones. Um, so I'm going to go straight into the questions. And our first one, uh, we have Carolyn Ramsbottom with us. Carolyn, what's your question? Welcome. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon. And thank you all so much for all the work that you are doing on this, because it is so appreciated. So thank you. My question today is how damaging to mental health, is it for children and their families being sent into unmitigated, potentially dangerous schools each day with no end to this in sight? Thanks, Carolyn. That's an incredibly important question, generally for the mental health of children, but also for your specific concerns about going into dangerous schools. Who would like to answer that? I'm wondering whether I should go to Susan first on that, but I'm sure Steve will want to say something. Sure. And Benita's got her hand up too. Oh, um, sorry. Yeah. yeah, really good, good question. And um, if you're putting children and families into unsafe situations, inevitably that will cause anxiety for some of them. And one can't generalise because obviously children are different, families are different, schools are different. Um, so the extent of harm, I would say, is variable. What's really important is to ensure that um, children are able to speak to somebody about the concerns they have. 
you know, I think we're in a situation where there's potential harm. And then it's a question of what can we do to minimise any harm that will come from, from putting children into these situations. So encouraging children to talk to parents, to friends and, and to school teachers about any concerns they have and ensuring those concerns aren't brushed off, that they're really listened to and understood and an, an appropriate conversation has had about the, the level of concern, the level of harm or level of risk, um, but also really importantly, um, what they and others can be doing um, to minimise that risk. So I'll just start off with those very general points. But yeah, I'm sure Benita and Steve have got um, other things to add to that. OK, Steve next, then Benita. Thank you. I mean, I, I agree with Susan. I think it's going to be incredibly variable. And I think perhaps as a consequence of, of some of the messaging or, or most of the messaging that's come from government, actually, maybe quite a few children and families aren't too affected by this unless perhaps they have a good reason to. So, for example, if they have vulnerable relatives, <laughs> uh, et cetera. I, I think that there really has been a bit of mismanagement of, of messaging around the vulnerability of children, about the need for childhood vaccines. We can see that in the incredibly poor uptake. I wish I don't wish the children were more anxious, but I do wish that um, the Department for Education would enable schools to do more so it wasn't left down to, to parents to try and put things like um, filtration devices in, in, in classrooms and things like that. I think that the, this, the problem for children is, is overlooked and is only going to get worse over the winter. But yeah, I think that, as, as Susan said, I think it's a really um, difficult one to generalise. I have, have every sympathy for children who are in a difficult place in, in their classroom. It's just not right. Anthony, you're muted, but um, I was hoping you, you were saying uh, for me to come in. So, um, yeah, no, thank you for raising that question, Carolyn. I think um, that I feel that children fall into two camps, probably those children who are, are oblivious to the risks that they're at by being in an unmitigated environment and those who are really well informed because they are either clinically vulnerable themselves or they live with someone they're trying to protect. And I think there is a mental health implication of a child bringing home an infection to a clinically vulnerable sibling or parent or grandparent uh, and the impact that has. And I just want to emphasize that I don't think anybody in independence age wants schools closed. We don't want lockdowns. It's, it is about being safe in those environments. Um, I have been successful in getting air filtration into the into my daughter's schools I have a 10 year old and a 12 year old the high school is building their own filters um, and the primary school let us crowdfund and buy them for ourselves but that was with the support of uh, the the director of public health and a huge amount of effort on my half mm. to push that forward but it's but as Steve says it shouldn't have to be the parents who push this it should be the education. Some of the levers that you might want to think about are the clean air targets of the school. Um, so the local authorities do have clean air targets around pollution and indoor air quality. That that actually is an open door um, because uh, it, it's and it's taking the conversation away from COVID rightly or wrongly. That seems to help. Um, so that's something you might want to think about. Um, but anyway, I could probably talk all day about this subject. So I'll let I'll let others come in. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd just add, I was reading a systematic review this week about mental health issues with children. And the view is that most children actually are very resilient. But if, if a child has a history of severe anxiety, depression or suicidal tendencies or any post-traumatic experiences or loss of a, a relative, a close relative, then those children are more vulnerable. So you have to take that you know, into account. Okay. Um, Anthony oh, Zubeda. Zubeda, I beg your pardon, I've just seen you. <laughs> Go ahead. Really, just, just a quick one. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Carolyn, that's a really important question um, because one of the things that's, that's not, been take, not been taken into account throughout the entire pandemic is that children are not a uniform group, particularly in the context of their backgrounds. And this really matters, and, and it's not just about the cost of living crisis, but it really matters when you take into account child poverty, when you take into account low income families. 
The consequences of low income families, families in precarious work. We know, for instance, that 70% of children in poverty are in working households. The consequence of children bringing back COVID into those households, the consequence of children bringing back COVID in households that are multi generational, are all very different from households that are much more sort of nuclear in terms of like two children, you know, mum and dad, relatively well off and so on, hugely different. And that causes a lot of stress for children. We know that poverty is highly correlated to stress. We know that children in poverty have much higher levels of anxiety and stress. So in that sense, it has big consequences and it has consequences for a parent that falls very ill with COVID or a grandparent, parents having to take time off when they're in insecure work or they're in low income households. We know that benefits are not covering it completely right now and it will only get worse in the cost of living crisis. So yes, thank you for really mentioning that because it's really important. Carolyn, do you want to say something? Yes, it was just to say that actually the stress, I also think um, then passes is is the parents are under tremendous stress because they, are trying to keep up a face that to send that to sending their child into an unmitigated, potentially mm-hmm. dangerous situation, and they have to sleep with that every night, thinking, you know, I have no opportunity, no other opportunity, no other, you know, I have to do this. But that impacts on their well-being and their mental health, and I believe that that can then show in different ways in a family situation because we all know if we're under tremendous stress that can make people short temper that can make people ill and there is no end in sight for parents to this and that is where i think it is really damaging because we can all cope with stress for a certain short period of time but the government do not seem to be addressing the fact that actually as you all rightly said clean air in schools would be such a fantastic things for parents to feel that they had that support, but they just haven't got that support, sadly. We completely agree with you. That's an incredibly important point. And it just adds to all the other stresses at the moment of energy and cost of living. Mm. And, and so thank you so much for that question. I'm going to go on to thank the second. We've got thank 14. You. So I'm going to go on to Sorry. the second one. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, next is from Michelle Martin. Michelle, you're... If, if I pronounced it right, is it Michelle or Michele? It is Michelle, yes. Thank you. Uh, I can't start my video, never mind. Um, as an ex-scientist, I've been really concerned. Oh, I've been asked to start my video now. Okay. Uh, as an ex-scientist, I've been really concerned at the way the response to COVID has undermined science and scientists and fueled lots of misinformation, especially by anti-vaxxers. Um, that's why I'm such a huge fan of you guys at Indie Spage, because you continue to pri- provide us with the latest evidence on COVID and shined a light of facts, dispelling all the myths and, and, and rumours and, and lies. Now, recently, a research paper was published by the Journal, in, Journal of Insulin Resistance calling for the suspension of all COVID mRNA vaccines due, cons- due to concern over side effects in younger people. What do you make of this? Thank you, uh, Michelle. Um, who's going to take that first? I've forgotten. Is it Steve or Trish? Trish. <clears throat> You're mute. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of things coming up here. Um, and I just wanted, before we get onto the specific thing about mRNA vaccines in young people, which is not my field, and others will comment on that, I just wanted to comment generally about what do we mean by a scientific paper? What do we mean by a rigorous peer-reviewed process? Uh, And one of the things that has happened in academic journals over the last particularly five or 10 years is that there has been a rise in what we call predatory journals. Uh, And that's that's kind of nickname that we academics give to journals that look like they're publishing rigorous, robust science but actually they're they're kind of pretending to be academic journals and they're not really. Now, 
the journals that, that most of us quite like to publish in are things like the British Medical Journal and the Lancet and Nature and Science. Those are journals that you will have heard of. And then there are a lot of other <clears throat> journals uh, which are a bit more niche, you know, the Journal of Pediatric Cardiology or whatever it might be. And you don't know whether they're true or whether they're real or not. Uh, and it can be quite hard to judge. Now, the journal that you named, the Journal of Insulin Resistance, is not one that I had ever heard of before a, a certain controversial paper got published in it. So the questions, I'm not going to comment on that journal because I don't know much about it, but the questions you need to ask about that journal are, wait a minute, what are its standards for accepting uh, a paper? And not just what is the peer, whether it's got a peer review process, whether the paper has been peer reviewed, but whether it's been peer reviewed to a high enough standard by someone who is completely independent of the journal. So for example, if... Uh, someone is publishing a paper in a journal on which they are on the editorial board that you want to smell a rat if that's happening, uh, unless they've got a very, very clear, dispassionate process uh, for kind of going round the, the person that they know on, on the editorial board, if you know what I mean. So that's all I'm going to say. Uh, but I think we need to be very careful uh, uh, about thinking that this is um, the same kind of scientific journal as, for example, the Lancet or the, or the British Medical Journal. My, my personal suspicion is that it may not be. I'll hand back to you, Anthony. That was very diplomatic. Um, Steve, did you want to say something? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I completely echo what Trish said, <laughs> definitely. Now, I think... What, what really saddens me about these, these sorts of reports is that nobody says that vaccines are perfect, okay? No medicine is perfect. We always, always, always find very rare side effects from any medicine. And that's because we are genetically diverse individuals and we respond to things in a different way. And particularly if you're giving a, a, a pretty potent stimulus to our immune system, we are going to have different side effects. Some of us might feel shivery and achy. Some of us might feel more unwell than that some of us might not even notice okay now there are rare side effects in these vaccines we know this okay and the particular focus on childhood vaccines is important because we do know there is a signal in particularly adolescent males that you are more likely to get um, things like myocarditis pericarditis okay that does happen there have i think been maybe one or two deaths across the planet i think the problem is that there are these self-reporting systems where patients associate things that happen with the fact they had a vaccine a week, two weeks, three months, seven years ago. Okay. And when those reporting systems are then validated, often what you find is that the actual proportion that are directly causal is very small indeed. Now, that's not to say it doesn't happen. And of course it does happen. And we have to be concerned about this. And this is why when we've rolled out billions and billions and billions of vaccine doses across the planet, the pharmaceutical companies and indeed the health agencies around the planet have to keep track of these severe events. And that's what those reporting systems are for. And they follow them up and they validate them. OK, I'm not saying they do that perfectly, but certainly the way that some of these narratives are twisted into saying that the, these, these vaccines do more harm than good really doesn't get supported by any evidence that I'm aware of. It's really important to emphasize as well that, that pediatric doses, the younger, you know, under 12s, have such a small dose of vaccine that the risk of that heart inflammation is virtually zero. So really, on balance, the greater benefit for the population is to get vaccinated because the, the, the side effects you have, well, the effects you have from COVID are always far, far worse, apart from in a very small number of very unfortunate and sad cases. Thank you. And oh, Sheena, quickly, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add to it because there's, there's, there's been a lot of discussion about this, this issue of myocarditis. And I think another thing to, to think about is where the, the information is coming from in terms of the sources that they use to make the claims. And unfortunately, the particular sources can often be problematic as well. So it's worth looking at the sources of the claims. But in terms of this, this question about myocarditis, so that's of inflammation of the kind of heart tissue sort of and one of the things is that yes we are seeing a bit of an increased risk in young males so age between 18 to 29 years old we're seeing around 
0.2 to 2.2 cases of, of, of the sort of myocarditis, sometimes a little higher, this variation in the, the cases from the booster vaccines. But this is much, much lower than the risk from infection itself. And a viral infection in and of itself can cause a risk of infection of myocarditis. And the important thing is how severe it is <clears throat> because myocarditis is not binary. It has kind of, you know, very mild myocarditis all the way through to severe and life-threatening. And what we're seeing is that the myocarditis that is happening with the vaccine is actually relatively mild only a very, very small proportion of people will actually need any hospital interventions, around 2%. Nearly all of them are recovering. Um, and this is not what we're seeing from the actual virus itself. So if you get it from the virus, unfortunately, you're getting a much, much, much higher risk of severe myocarditis and death. So at the moment, the evidence is really that the virus itself is much, much more risky. I, I'm more of a hardliner. I would uh, have a lot of these people that put out fake conspiracy stuff on dodgy science struck off and removed from Twitter and that because uh, they they can kill people. You know, if if you create an atmosphere and people don't get vaccinated, then you can end up with people getting severe illness and dying. And that is, you know, we've seen in the United States this week, the guy that was putting out fake stuff about the Sandy Hook massacre, accusing the parents of, you know, bereft parents who've lost children of faking it all. Now, he's been fined up to a billion dollars in the courts. But, you know, uh, I mean, this shouldn't happen. And it's a bit like people who make fake drugs and push them into countries. I would have them in prison for life. You know, I think these are crimes against people. So I'm I'm a bit of a heartliner when it comes to fake science. Just to cheer you all up. Right. Um, thank you. Any any final comment, Michelle? Thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. That's okay. perfect. Just thank what you, you do. Keep going. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. <laughs> um, the next is from Reza Makani. Reza, over to you. And we look forward to your question. Hello, I think my video is just starting. I hope you can hear me. Um, yes, uh, my question was, at the start of the pandemic, many of the COVID deaths were reported to be the result of respiratory related problems such as lung failure. Was the cause of this ever identified? And was there a change in the treatment regimen that helped? Very good question. And you're absolutely right that the kind of respiratory problems we saw early on have to some extent shifted for a whole number of reasons. Who would like to answer that? Um, Benita, you're a res well, respiratory consultant. Couldn't get better. Well, thanks, Anthony. <laughs> no pressure. On, no pressure there. Um, so, Reza, that's a, it's a brilliant question, actually. And what's quite interesting is I think the, the thinking scientifically of what COVID does to the lungs has shifted quite significantly since the start of the pandemic. So, at the start of the pandemic, we called it a COVID pneumonia, COVID pneumonitis. That suggests inflammation of the actual airways of the lung. But what we understand now is that this is much more likely to be a disease of the, the very small blood vessels in the lung. And uh, some radiologists would go as far as saying this actually isn't a pneumonia because it has a completely different appearance. And one of the one of the um, theories that, that, that I've recently um, been more familiar with is the fact that the blood vessel disease actually comes first and then it affects the, the lung tissue. So we're still always learning about this all of the time. Um, and so I don't think it was overreported as such, and it did cause very severe disease in the early stage. And I think that I think the, the nature of the disease has changed, partly through vaccination, partly um, through the, the variants and, and the virus mutating. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that we won't have a variant around the corner that could cause problems with the lungs again. We're seeing very different clinical manifestations with each of the different variants. Um, and I think that's what makes this, this a very difficult problem to deal with in medicine. Um, there was something about the treatments as well, and I've forgotten the second part of the question, but I'll, I'll let others come in. Uh, it was about, has there been a change in treatment regime that helped? I guess the dexamethasone would be... Uh... 
an important yeah, issue I, there. I, I think absolutely the, the the drugs, the the MAB sort of drugs that target the the um, individual cytokines the steroids, um, all of that has helped this now become a less severe disease if you can access the drugs and you can get them in early enough. Okay, thank you. Sheena, you wanted to say something. Yeah, so I think one of the other things that we saw early doors was what we were calling a cytokine storm. So as an immunologist, this was not a term that perhaps most people were familiar with, but in immunology, we were very familiar with this. So this is what happens when your immune system becomes overstimulated. It starts making these inflammatory products, which we call cytokines, and they themselves then kind of trigger other immune cells, and they also cause a lot of damage. And this is what we were seeing, unfortunately, with some of these severe patients um, with covid and one of the game changers in terms of treatments, as Anthony's just said, was dexamethasone. And that worked by dampening down the immune response. And what was amazing about that is how cheap that drug is, how widely available that drug is. So it meant it could be used very widely. As we've gone on, we've been able to start looking at more specific targets of the immune system and really enhance therapies. And of course, the vaccines have prevented us from actually developing these severe immune autoreactions. reactions. Okay, thanks very much. I hope that's okay, Razor. Um, thank you for your question. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Um, I'm gonna go on. I've got a whole number of questions that have been sent in. The first one is from Janie from Gloucestershire. Is there any way of arranging for a teenager to have a COVID booster if they are not clinically vulnerable? If they were very unwell with COVID and off school for weeks and recovered very slowly after that, is there any way anywhere in the UK you can pay for the vaccine or in Europe? Uh, Trish, is that? Um, I don't know about Europe. I'm pretty sure you can't do this in UK. And it looks like Sheena's got more information on that than me, but it, it, it sadly, uh, and this is about the practicalities, not about the science. I, I don't think it's possible in UK, but let me hand over to Sheena. Um, no, you're absolutely right, uh, Trisha. There is no plans, as far as I'm aware now, to enable the vaccines to be rolled out and, and, and enable some people to buy them or access them more widely. It may change um, depending on how the vaccine booster uptake is. If there's plenty of vaccines left, they may start to look at that. I really hope we see a wider availability, but I would actually prefer if it wasn't being paid for, to be honest, because that immediately excludes certain communities of people from being able to access the vaccine. But yeah, I, I think everybody should be able to get it. I, I don't understand this. So is it because of a lack of supplies and they want to reserve them for elderly populations first is that the main reason for not giving i think boosters? they were looking at the most the clinically most vulnerable but i i, I mean i can't speak for the government but I, it, it feels to me that there there is perhaps an under appreciation of the significance of how serious this condition is for many people and in particular yeah. the seriousness of conditions such as long covid which we know we've got over two million people living with yeah. so I, exactly. I, I feel that that is part of the problem and actually, if, if one of my children, I mean, they're older now, but if they've been unwell like that and off school for weeks and recovering very slowly, I'd be desperate to get them a booster. But anyway, uh, Steve, sorry. I I just debated my no, 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 Steve, you go uh, ahead. OK, yeah, I, I completely agree. I think we should be vaccinating younger people. I think we should be vaccinating across the board. In particular, you know, this winter, we're going to see school transmission. We're going to see transmission at universities. I think many of us who work at universities are already seeing that. Um, and it's going to be a major issue. And there's this really worrying myth that the vaccines don't prevent the transmission of this disease. Now, certainly the newer variants are causing problems in the sense that our antibodies that are made from the vaccines aren't as good. They don't last as long against them. But for a short term, in terms of the winter transmission boom, which we are likely to see caused by whichever variant. We do this with influenza. We vaccinate small children to prevent that spread around the community. It makes sense to prevent the transmission because, you know, things like long COVID and the higher the prevalence of this virus, the more likely, less likely things are to happen. So 
we, we heard about severe pneumonitis and, and vascular disease in severe COVID before, we'll start to see those numbers going up. That's just, that's just numbers. And we can't stop that if we're not vaccinating people. Thanks, Steve. Can I um, just add very quick, yeah. sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Huck. <laughs> sorry, I really quickly, Anthony, I just wanted to add, the only, the only focus on children in this entire pandemic has been about exams, has been about just exams. And it hasn't been about their health or their welfare. It certainly hasn't been about their health because apart from just talking about mental health, nothing's been done about that. But in terms of COVID and the impact on their health, there's been absolutely nothing. And to that extent, children have been invisibilized, completely and utterly invisibilized in this pandemic. So well, all children aged five to 12, in the United States and across the whole of Europe, bar the UK and Sweden, are being vaccinated. So we are the outlier in all of this. But anyway, that's, uh, we've got a lot more questions. I'm going to move on to two quick questions to Duncan, actually. The first is from Louise Tippett. Um, when Duncan showed the figures as percentage of those who've come forward for their booster, does it include future bookings or just those who've actually had the booster? That was one. So NHS reports uh, every week the number of people who out of the population who've had the vaccine. So it's actually being administered. So yeah. it doesn't show it forward. But tune in next week and you'll see what it will be. <laughs> OK. And the second one, which comes from Rune Betch, if I've got that pronounced correctly. Um, how does COVID now compare to flu in terms of mortality? Well, I think this is something that goes right back to the early days of, uh, of uh, COVID, where people were saying it's just the flu. And then it was, you know, you could look at, say, over 50s who had about 25 uh, times uh, mortality from COVID than influenza. And now, of course, that was without vaccines. And we have a hugely vaccinated population, certainly in the UK. So those numbers are definitely coming down. Um but we are seeing admissions from COVID, uh, with COVID or, um, or um, uh, including COVID, significantly higher than admissions for flu. Um, and the thing about COVID is you can get it more than one time. Uh, so it's very difficult to compare them because they're grouped um, in terms of the data, in terms of influenza and pneumonia. Um, but really, I think the, the point being that what can you do individually, the thing you can do is to get the vaccine. So whether it's flu or whether it's COVID, get the vaccine and you can do as much as you can for yourself. Didn't Christina say last week there have been 40,000 deaths from with COVID or, because, you know, directly as a cause of COVID over this year so far? That sounds about right. I haven't got the figures in front of me, but yeah, yeah huge numbers. Yeah. Steve, did you want to say something? Yeah, I think, you know, as, as, as Duncan rightly said, the, the numbers are confusing because they lump standard pneumonia in. But from a virological standpoint, you're comparing chalk with cheese. OK, I mean, you should not underestimate influenza. It kills people across the planet every year. But seasonal influenza is something that is only changing very slightly from the thing that's come before. It still causes a lot of devastation disease. It's a nasty virus. And we don't do well enough against influenza, in my view. We don't vaccinate well enough. We can, we've got fantastic vaccines against influenza. They're not as good as the COVID vaccines, but they are pretty good. The nasal one in children is really good at stopping transmission. We still get mortality and morbidity from this virus, but we don't do enough. But the direct comparison for COVID would be a couple of years after a flu pandemic, which we haven't seen since 2009. And thankfully, that wasn't particularly pathogenic, still devastating in many ways. So comparing seasonal flu with COVID is, is like comparing a, a goldfish with a shark. And, and it's really to do with our host immunity and the fact that these viruses are something that we're used to dealing with as opposed to a novel pandemic strain. If we have a pandemic influenza, there's plenty of bird flu around in the UK at the moment. Please be careful with dead birds. Um, we really shouldn't be making these comparisons in my view. Thanks very much, Steve. Next question comes from Tim Latham. For immune compromised or medically vulnerable people who've had a serious COVID infection requiring therapeutics such as Paxlovid, that's an antiviral, how concerned should they be from contracting another COVID infection? Would a second infection have increased risks of sever or severity? Would they be able to receive Paxlovid a second time? Would the therapy work as well? 
or would there be less efficacy from Paxlovid used a second time with a second infection? I think that's one probably for Steve, but perhaps Sheena as well. Um, well, I guess, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll stick to the Paxlovid side of things because I'm sure Sheena's about to say about what the immunity will be. Um, very sorry to hear that you were so unwell and that you're in that position to need the Paxlovid. The Paxlovid is working really, really well um, at the moment, assuming you can access it, which does have some geographical variations. Um, if you're concerned, go to your GP. They can get in touch with your local um, therapeutic distribution distribution place at the, at the hospital. Um, it does work very well at preventing severe disease. And we know that from trials and we know that from real life now. Paxlovid is, is probably... It's great because you can take tablets. You don't have to go into hospital and have it in your veins as you do for endesivir. Okay, there should be no reason if you see SARS-CoV-2 again at the moment that the Paxlovid won't work a second time because we're not seeing resistance growing abundantly at the moment or at all. Hopefully, touch wood, um, to this drug. So yes, you should be able to have it a second time. Just make sure that you check that your other medications that you take are consistent with having Paxlovid. Uh, Sheena? And in terms of immunity, I mean, there's lots of different ways that you can be immunocompromised and they, they may involve different parts of your immune system not working quite so well. So it may be that, that um, perhaps you have a little bit less of the, the ability to make antibodies. The vaccination is going to help kind of top that up to its maximal levels. But in terms of prior infection, making you more vulnerable to a second infection, um, as long as you're sort of vaccinating and you're, you know, you, we haven't got evidence that you are more vulnerable to a second infection. There is some concerns around something called imprinting that means depending on your first experience, immune experience that is, of an infection, it can affect how you subsequently respond. So people, for example, who were infected with the original strain of of COVID didn't do quite as well with the Omicron strain. They perhaps felt a little worse, but it didn't mean that their immune system wasn't working hard. It just perhaps meant that their immune system was making them feel a little less well. But that's sometimes feeling unwell as your immune system doing its job. The, the drugs that Steve was talking about are independent of the immune system. They're targeting the virus. There are other types of drugs that we can provide. Um, the monoclonals and the like, they're still working pretty well as well. So I think at the moment, there's a good range of things. And with the vaccination as well, there's a good range of things to try and keep immunocompromised people like yourself. I'm assuming you're talking about yourself, safe. Thanks very much, Sheena. I've got a next question, which is really interesting. It says, how do each of you, I'm only going to come to two of you, practically live with COVID in your everyday life? How do you strike the really difficult balance between still living a brackets bearable life and minimizing risk for COVID and long medium COVID? So I think we'll come to uh, I think that's one for Susan and Zubeda. All right. And Benita. Susan, <laughs> I'm, sure we've all got things, I'm sure we've all got things to say on this, but I think. The key thing that I do is try and judge the risk of any situation I'm in. Um, so what that means is with my work, I will go to conferences and meetings if I find out in advance that the ventilation is good or that they have a good air filtration system. Or when I go to those meetings, I'll go to the meetings. But if I discover that, for example, they're going out for a meal in the evening and if it's an enclosed space, then I won't go to that. So I try and get a balance between engaging with things, but not engaging with things that are going to be, be risky. It's very difficult often to judge what is risky because some people can give you information and others can't. Um, if you're in modern buildings, um, then they're more likely to have uh, decent uh, ventilation systems, uh, but you can't always guarantee it. So that's the main thing I do. I also have a, a small air filtration unit in the front room where we have uh, people over. So that's always on whoever comes over um, or, you know, when it's warm enough, I have windows or back door open. So I think those are the main things. I just really look out for um, air, air quality and avoiding crowds and indoor spaces. Lovely. Thank you. Let's go to Benita, then Zubeda. 
Yeah, um, I do exactly the same. I, I do a risk assessment on every individual uh, uh, situation I'm in. If there are windows in a venue I'm going to, I will be the person who goes and opens them. Don't always make myself popular, but uh, take warm warm clothes everywhere I go. I have them. Um, I literally have one of these everywhere I go. <laughs> it's a this is an FFP3 mask, and because I work in a hospital on a respiratory ward, that's what I would wear on a plane. It's what I'd wear in a it, you know, on in a high risk situation. Where I know there's definitely COVID, but actually, if you're in public you don't know if people have got COVID or not. So actually you want to protect yourself and, and behave like you, you are at risk of catching it. Um, so I think everything Susan said, plus masking, um, particularly indoor spaces. Zoobs, Zubeda, sorry, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's not easy, is it? Um, I have two teenage children and it makes it really easy to just take risk assessments for yourself because the two teenage children are much harder to um, persuade all the time to, to, to act in the same way. And I, I wanted to say that because I know that it, lots of people will be faced with that because the one thing we know from the pandemic is especially around children is it's hit them so hard. They took the brunt of it that it's very difficult to say, no, you can't go out and hang out with 40 teenagers um, without mask and in enclosed spaces and so on. So I just want to say that, 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 that that's a challenge. Now, in terms of personally, I agree with my colleagues that you have to take risk assessments. Um, I suppose the things that I do is public transport, uh, I, I always wear a mask, or I always try to wear a mask on public transport. It's not easy, it's warm, hardly anyone else wears it, but I'm really conscious, I'm really conscious, and I've learned this from my colleagues, that it's not just about you, it's about protecting others. And um, what we know about COVID is so many people don't show their symptoms or they don't realize they have COVID until several days later. So I tend to wear FFP2 P2 masks on um, the subway, on the underground, but also in supermarkets because we know supermarkets are one of those common places where you pick up COVID. I'm also conscious that I have elderly neighbors um, and I see, you know, I have friends with vulnerable children. So I think in that sense, you do what you can. I also want to pick up on that point that Susan and Benita picked up on, which is there is this real notion in public. You know, I think on the one hand, it, it's great that we've started to do things more so that people, in terms of the mental health, it helps them to get out, that we have more seminars happening, more gatherings happening in that way. But people have stopped opening windows, let alone think about the air quality and ventilation. They're just not there at all. And I was particularly conscious a couple of days ago, I was at an event where there were lots of vulnerable people and lots of vulnerable people were even talking about their vulnerability in a different context, not in terms of COVID, but they were vulnerable, they were disabled, and yet not a single window was open in this room full of people. So in that, in that, in that way, I really urge people to just remember that message of open windows, improve ventilation, think of air quality. Yeah, when, when I go to a Millwall home game, I always wear a mask on the tube, and I wear a mask when I get to walking in the crowded corridors. But when I'm out in the open air, I have to take my mask off because you can't shout abuse at the referee with a mask on. It's, it's you know, that makes my life bearable and I can cathart. Anyway, right, that's, I've got two questions now, which I'm going to aim actually at first to Trish. So one from Jane Paxton says, in these most worrying of political times, brackets in the context of people seeing government restrictions as coercive, how do we ensure the uptake of emergency public health recommendations? And linked to that in a way, uh, Bernard Boyle has said, why are all staff in hospitals not issued with proper FFP3, FFP2 or N95 masks, which seems to be the way to reduce the chances of a spread of infection? Both excellent questions. Why have yeah. we had so many hospital infections? Over to you, Trish. Well, I can, I can answer the second one better than I can answer the first one. I wish I knew what we do 
where in in a culture in a context where basic public health measures are viewed as unacceptably coercive um, whoever asked that question is, is very insightful. We, we are in a dreadful situation. And if we just think back to the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, where we were sort of looking, you know, anxiously at these stories coming from China, we wanted the government to give us advice. We wanted to be told what we could do to protect ourselves, protect our communities. And I think most of us, probably almost all of us were willing to uh, take measures which might have compromised our own freedoms, but which would have um, increased the chance that, that we as a society would get through the pandemic uh, as quickly as possible. We're now nearly three years later in, in a very different place where it's, it's quite a kind of headline thing that, that my freedoms are more important than your rights and all that kind of thing. And I, I think there, there, there is some research on, on this, but it's, it is not, it's not uh, something I know in, in great detail, but I, I would say the person who's pointed out that this is a problem is, is absolutely right. The issue about uh, why aren't, was it why aren't health professionals or why aren't, yeah, see, I would say any, anybody in a hospital uh, anybody, if you're whether you're a patient, whether you're somebody visiting a hospital, uh, visiting a relative, or whether you're a member of staff in that hospital, should be uh, wearing the kind of mask that that is a very very efficient filter of that virus, which, as we probably know by now, is spread through the air. So the best kind of mask is your FFP2, FFP3 mask. It's got to fit you. It's got to be sealed around the edges because otherwise the air goes you know, through the gaps and it's no good. Why hospitals are not doing this? It, it's absolutely extraordinary. And it's partly because infection control teams in hospitals are still, some of them, thinking that it's spread by droplets, like certain diseases are spread by droplets, and so they've kind of got a droplet mindset. Uh, it's also because people incorrectly interpret the advice from the UK Health Security Agency, used to be Public Health England, uh, they in incorrectly interpret that advice as saying, we mustn't supply these high filtration masks. Uh, that you know, the, the the low bar is enough. So I think there's quite a lot of confusion and perception uh, about what the central advice is, but also because people are still in a droplet mindset, and and that's something. If you, anybody follows me on Twitter, I, I tweet a lot about it, and I write a lot of letters and uh, and try and do some campaigning around that. But again, it's a great shame that that you know, more than two and a half years after we, we demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt that this virus was airborne, uh, people are still acting as if it's not airborne. And, and that is a scandal, actually. Thanks very much, Trish. I've got two final questions which are linked and will be speedy because we're almost at time, um, both about variants. So one from, I think, must be a scientist, Jilly Carew. She says, with us being in variant soup or Pentagon, and by that, she means that there are a current collection of variants with five shared mutations on the spike protein. Um, the question is, are reinfections likely to be shorter spaced in between? So that's going to go to Steve and Sheena. And the second question is from Izzy Coxall, who says, with the new soup of more immune evasive variants, can our alt lateral flow tests still detect COVID or is their reliability reduced even more? So it's infection shorter spaced LFTs. Steve. Um, I can quickly do the second one first, if you like. Um, yeah, they work because the, the LFTs pick up the, it's a different part of the virus particle. It's called the N protein, the nuclear capsid protein. And the changes that we see in spike are way more extensive than we see in the, the in the end protein so so we're detecting the physical presence of particles when we run those tests on those sticks okay and that protein doesn't change so as far as i understand there haven't been any changes that i know of that have stopped those working so that's that's important of course we should have them definitely provided for free for people in low incomes and we should have them everywhere because they are hugely enabling when we have high prevalence okay um 
In terms of reinfection, it, it sometimes depends on the definition of a reinfection because Public Health England, sorry, UKSHA, I say, have a different cutoff. They have a 90 day cutoff in terms of the facts and figures. But we know, certainly anecdotally and certainly um, from, from other studies, that reinfection can occur much more sooner than that. Um, I think probably could see that in kids this winter if you, if you unfortunately don't have your children vaccinated and things. Um, yeah, these things are changing quite dramatically from one another. And that's not to say that our protection against severe disease is being dismantled, but certainly our antibodies are less able to recognize the spike protein than it was against some other strains, certainly the old Wuhan strain, but Omicron is changing dramatically all the time. And I'll let Sheena okay. take Any final quick comment, Sheena, because we're over time. Okay, well, I'll try and I, I've actually just done a thread today about some of the ways it hides from the immune system. So I can point you at that. Um, the virus has got lots of ways it can do it. Steve's mentioned one around the antibody. It can affect one of our main um, ways that we kill virus, the interferon pathway. This is a really important cytokine protein that helps protect <laughs> cells. It's like a ring of protection, but also it can kill viruses. And it's got multiple ways that it can interfere with that. It can also affect how we see immune response, how we see the virus as well. So all of these things together do mean that the virus is getting better at hiding. And also, unfortunately, as Danny Altman's wonderful data has shown, um, that unfortunately we are seeing more reinfections, particularly since we've had Omicron. We just don't seem to be getting such a good, robust, long-term immune response. But yeah, the more we can do to try and prevent infection, the less likely it is that it can mutate. It only mutates as much as it does because of so many bodies and so many noses and so many cells it's going in. And that gives it the best possible chance to mutate. So let's get the numbers down with public health and we'll see less of that happening. Thanks very much. Now, Amanda Botting, Sally O and Keith Baverstock, we're going to carry your questions over to next week. They're all excellent um, just to let you know before we go, we've had regime change at Indy Sage. It's not just quasi quarting that's gone, but Professor Dean and Pillay has also retired and stepped down as chair. He's we didn't been a sack magnificent. Him. <laughs> we didn't sack him. No, he, he <laughs> has actually retired. Um, uh, anyway, he's been magnificent as a scientist, a colleague, a wise head during the pandemic, and he also accepted with good grace my weekly abuse of him. Uh, the members of Indy Sage have decided upon another dual leadership, a bit like Truss and Quasi Quarting. And so Steve Griffin and I will be taking over the chair responsibilities for now. We hope we'll last a bit longer than the current government, but we'll be leading Indy Sage into the sunlit up uplands of the remainder of the pandemic. As always, we'll be back next week, same time, same place. Till then, keep safe. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Bye.